I'll say you again for you.
built for square? Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat>
Welcome. We are here. Why did you always have to look in that toilet? Isn't that true? Yes, it is. What for people's sake? Oh, they're for the musicians. Yeah. Well, it should be in the front of your regular book. Oh, it should. I have to use my bag of Yes, it definitely should. I don't have that trouble with your bag of the weather. You know what I did? There's a little plastic perforated section on the side. And you have it. Well, it should be on the day. No, it should have been on the day. No, it should have been on the day. No, it should have been on the day. Yeah. Uh, or you can yeah. 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 Ye
folder.
now, if you turn your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, that's where we will continue in our study of that minor prophet. And I keep telling you every week, hopefully you're starting to learn to put a bookmark there. It doesn't get any easier to find, unless you got a bookmark. Well, we're in chapter 1 still. We're going to look down here starting in verse 12. What's the name of the Habakkuk. Uh, if you find Matthew, hang a left, and he's just a few books back. Okay. Okay. All right. I've said it before, if Mary can find it, then anybody can. Right, Jonathan David? You find it? Well, that's why God gave us a, uh, an index in the front. Otherwise, it's on page 1184. All right, the book of Habakkuk, we are in our second study. And we examined last week, the prophet came to the Lord with complaints. He, he says, Lord, I see wickedness all around me. I see wickedness in my city and in my country. Lord, aren't you going to do something about it? Well, he complained about it, but he sure didn't like what the Lord was going to do about it. He said, Lord, you should do something. The Lord said, okay, I'm going to do something. If it were told you, it would just you wouldn't even believe it. It'd make your ears tickle. You just wouldn't even be able to imagine what in the world I'm going to do. But I'm going to do something. And then Habakkuk was like, whoa, I don't know if that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a little discipline here. You know, a little smack on the wrist for our idolatry and such. But don't wipe us out. What was that, Lord? You're talking about bringing in the Chaldeans out from Babylon to, to judge your people? You're going to use pagans to judge your people? Well, so now the prophet takes up his lament now. First, he comes to the Lord with a complaint about unrighteousness. Now he comes with a lamentation about the Lord's justice. And he says, Lord, how can you do this? How could you possibly do this? Don't you care what happens to us? Well, let's read it here, and then we'll start looking at it a little closer. Verse 12 of chapter 1. Habakkuk declares, Are you not from everlasting? O oh, Jehovah, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. You might put it in parentheses, right? <laughs> oh, Jehovah, you have appointed them for judgment. And the idea there is judgment over us, to, to punish us, to bring judgment upon us. O oh, rock! You have marked them for correction, for our correction. And Habakkuk, you have to picture him really lamenting with, with tears in his eyes. Lord, you don't really mean you're going to use that pagan, wicked people to bring judgment and correction upon us, your people. Verse 13, he says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. So, Lord, why do you look on those, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person or a nation more righteous than he? Why do you make them like fish of the sea? Why do you make the people of the earth like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? Lord, you're supposed to be our God and our protector. You're supposed to be our judge. Why do you make us like we're just random fish of the sea that, that have no ruler over them? No one to take care of them. They're just out in the deep blue to fend for themselves. Why do you make us like that is the idea. They take up all of them with a hook. Speaking now sort of as the Babylonians are like fishers of men in the worst sense. <laughs> that they'll hook you and take you as a captive. You know, they're not interested in spreading the gospel like Jesus was. Remember, he said, you come with me and I'll make you fishers of men. We'll share the gospel with people and lift people up out of the, the sea of sin. No, Nebuchadnezzar's not preaching no gospel here. He's coming in with hooks and he's going to put real hooks in your jaws and, and force you back to Babylon to be his slaves. They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Babylon just swoops around and like a, like a net they cast their weapons upon the earth and just drag people to themselves as slaves. Therefore, they, the Babylonians, rejoice and are glad because they're so strong, they're so powerful. Therefore, they sacrifice to their net, to their power, to their might, to their military strength. 
They sacrifice to their own power and burn incense to their dragnet, to, to their resources. Because by them, by their strength, by their military prowess, by them, their share is sumptuous. They're wiping everybody out. They're, they're taking nations here and countries there and people over here, and they're just taking plunder of the whole earth. Because by them, by their military strength, their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? You know, when you, you, you bring in a haul of fish and you're done, you empty it out and go get some more. You know, they, they get one nation, they're done with those slaves, now they go get some more. <coughs> Lord, what are you doing? Well, what's the old saying? Be careful what you wish for, Rebecca. You may get it. But he says at the beginning of verse chapter 2, verse 1, I'll stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he, the Lord, will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Okay, Lord, I, I have a feeling I've gone too far here. I, I feel like I've said too much. But Lord, I poured out my heart. So now I'm just going to wait for you and for your answer, even though I have a feeling it's going to be my own correction that you're going to bring for what I have said. Well, Habakkuk here, just, just pouring out his heart, lamenting to the Lord because of the Lord's justice. The Lord is now too just for Habakkuk. At first it was, oh Lord, don't you see all the wickedness? Now it's, Lord, you're judging wickedness so harshly, and we're the ones getting punished and wiped out. You know, it's fine to see someone else get judged and someone else get punished, but when it comes down upon yourself, well, then it's, it's a whole different story. You know, that's why they say, be careful when you point the finger, because you have those other ones pointing right back at you. And so I think that Habakkuk is sort of getting a taste of his own medicine. N not, not really aware of what he was saying, and now he understands the full breadth, the, the full weight of the things he was asking for. How can you do this? Is basically what he's saying. Especially there in verse 12. How can you do this? How can you, the everlasting God, how can you who are my God, how can you who are my Holy One, the one that I look to, the one that I am walking with, the one that I am learning from, how can you, my God, my Holy One, how can you, my rock, the one who my life is built on, the one that I'm trusting in, putting all my faith into, how can you do this to me, to my people? How can you do this to us? And I suppose the idea might be there is, don't you care what happens? How, how can you just lay down the, the justice, lay down the fury, bring down the hammer? So, so, it, it, it's like without discernment. Just, I'm just going to judge. I'm just going to bring it down hard. Lord, how can you do that? Don't you care what happens? And he, he laments, you have appointed our enemies to judge us. Lord, you're my God. You're my ruler. You're my holy one. You're my rock. Yet you have appointed our enemies to, to do your work. You've appointed our enemies to be our judge instead of yourself. You, you have appointed pagans to bring correction to us. When we read the Old Testament, the trick is to take what you're reading that's taking place in a very outward way, you know, there's an invading army coming against God's people here. The Babylonians are on the march, and Habakkuk understands that they're going to be God's instrument of correction. We want to take it in a New Testament way, and we want to take it inward. There's an inward application. When the Lord seems to bring down His heavy hand, to bring a heavy correction into our lives, or into our family, or into our church... We need to have a heart of reception. We need to have a heart that is open to receive the judgment, the correction, the discipline of God. See, Habakkuk is, is trying, to, trying to swallow this. He's trying to understand this. He's trying to comprehend what the Lord is doing. And what the Lord is doing is bringing correction to a very sinful nation. He is teaching an idolatrous Israel what idolatry is really all about. He's going to take these people who have loved to worship false gods, who have given themselves over so completely as a nation to idolatry, he is now allowing them to be taken captive by the, 
by, by, by the, the city, by the nation that is known as the center and the capital of idolatry. You want to worship false gods? I'm going to send you to the Mecca of idolatry. That's really what is going on here. And yet, it's difficult for Habakkuk. Lord, th this stings too much. Lord, surely the sin was not that bad. But like we said last week, this is a book that encourages to learn to trust the Lord when we don't agree with what he's doing. When we don't understand the way he is doing things. And I think it'd be helpful to read a few verses out of Hebrews chapter 12 in this respect. Hebrews chapter 12, you can mark it and look at it later. In verse 3, the writer says, Consider him, consider Jesus, who endured hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. I mean, if Jesus, the perfect man, had to strive against sinners, how can we who are imperfect expect, you know, such an easy road? But then he says, and it's really a, a hard word. It, it's really a word where he's trying to just stab us right in the heart so that we might look in the mirror of God's word and see ourselves for what we really are. Because he says there in verse 4 of Hebrews 12, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed in your fight against sin. Let that sink in for a second. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed in your fight against sin. When, when you battle sin in your life, when you battle temptations, the various lusts that each of us may or may not have, the, the different things that, that beset us, that get in our way, that stumble us, when we go into our prayer closet about those difficulties in our life that we can't seem to shake, those, those sins that seem to continually repeat themselves in our lives, and we begin to say, oh, woe is me. The writer here says, you have not yet resisted the bloodshed the way Jesus did. Jesus went to the cross in his battle with sin. You and I, perhaps we don't really understand what it is to fight against sin in our life. To battle against temptation in our life. To really go into the fray and really push so hard against sin. That you could really say, we're fighting so hard, it's like blood, sweat, and tears. We're not going to let sin have that hold in us. We're not going to let the enemy ruin our reputation as a Christian. We're not going to let the, the enemy, Satan, damage our witness as a Christian. And the writer would say, you have not yet resisted the bloodshed in your fight with sin, in your striving against sin. Look at the cross. Look at the damage Jesus endured on the cross. Now, he was the perfect man. His battle with sin was on our behalf. But look at his example. He took up a fight that wasn't even his. He took up a fight that was ours. And he is our example. Are we willing to go to that, to those lengths, in our battle, in our, in our heart against sin? In verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 12, he continues and says, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons or as daughters, as children. And he quotes an old proverb, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. That's what Habakkuk is doing. Clearly, he's despising the chastening of the Lord. Lord, I don't like this. Lord, how could you do this? How dare you do this? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. See, a rebellious son despises the chastening. A rebellious daughter despises the correction. We don't want to hear the reprimand. That's how children are with their parents, and that's how we are with the Father. We don't want to hear that the sin that we are condoning, that the sin that we are dabbling with, is something that we should be fighting against. And so he says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. And I try to teach my children that. Even when they don't like the, the discipline, the correction, it's because I love them. The Lord wants us to turn out right, just like we want our children to turn out right. He wants us to be good Christians who are a good testimony of the Father and His heart and His love. He wants us to represent Him well in the world, just as when my children grow up, I want them to represent my name wherever they go. I want people to look at them and say, well, your parents raised you right. I don't want them to see my kids and think, wow. What, what kind of bums did they have for parents, you know? I want them to represent me properly. See, we take the Lord's name with us. And so the Lord, 
whom he loves, he chastens, and he scourges. Now, that's what Habakkuk, he feels he was getting the scourge. Hey, Lord, you've really brought out the whip upon your people here in, in Jer Jerusalem and Judah. And he didn't like it. And so often we don't like it either in our own lives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons, as daughters, as children. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you can sort of get away with sin, just doing your own thing, the Lord never seems to bother you. Well, there's probably a reason for that. Maybe you're not one of His children here. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. So why do we get so mad at the Lord when He does the same thing? Like a backup here. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father and live? For they indeed are human fathers. For a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit. You know, our dads, you know, as, as best as they saw fit, they, they disciplined us. But the Father in heaven, he knows everything. So surely his discipline is even of a much higher caliber and degree, worth so much more profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That's what he wants. Remember, God told the prophet, look, you tell the people, get their marriages in order. I'm sick of all this divorce among God's people. Because don't they understand, I want godly offspring. I want children who are raised in godly homes, who are raised to love me, and who are raised to follow me. And so tell them to get their marriages in order. And see, the Lord here, once again, he says, I want people who can partake of my holiness. What did Jesus say? Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Be perfect as He is perfect. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. And Habakkuk says a big amen. That's right. It sure does. It seems awful. But painful. Nevertheless, afterward, He yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And it is worthy of note that after Israel, after Judah, after God's people went to Babylon, when they returned to their homeland, they never again... Uh, of all the sins they did struggle with, idolatry was never one of them ever again. They were cured of their idolatry in Babylon. Now, they weren't perfect. You know, when Jesus comes along, you got those hypocritical Pharisees. And what was their sin? Do you notice the opposite sin that they begin to commit? Instead of going into idolatry, they go into hypocrisy because they're trying to keep the law so tightly. We're, we're never going to go away from the law again. We're never going to go after paganism. We're going to keep the law, every jot, every tittle, every little piece of it. And, and so the Pharisees went too far and became hypocrites. You've got to be careful. God wants the balance here. He wants us to be, to be pure and balanced and genuine in our walk with Him. See, the Pharisees were so uptight about their, about their walk with God, they wanted everybody to believe they were perfect, that they never messed up. And the Lord wants us to understand that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for honest people that other people can relate with. Say, oh, how'd you deal with that? How'd you get through that? How'd the Lord help you with that? That's what the Lord is looking for in the family of God. So discipline, it's a difficult thing when the Lord begins to work in our lives against certain sins that we may be harboring. It can be harsh. It can be difficult. And yet the lesson of Habakkuk is just trust the Lord and allow him to do his work. Is he really the everlasting God who knows all, who created you? Is he really your God, your Holy One, your rock? Then if so, let him be such. Let him bring out the big stick. Let him take you out to the woodshed. Let him work in your life and, and let him do that, that hard work, that, that difficult work, that work that really does seem to be painful in your life. Because the result of it is the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The, the result of it is to be able to partake of His holiness. You know, we say amen to verses, He's transforming us from glory to greater glory. Praise the Lord. Well, how do you think He does that? By taking us out to the woodshed. It, it's no fun sometimes when the Lord has to deal with us with something that we thought we didn't have to deal with, that we thought was okay. And you ever notice, the Lord can be so... It's like He just doesn't understand sometimes. You've ever had the Lord convict you of something that He didn't convict other people of? Where he just said, this isn't something that is generally sin. This is not outright and gross sin. It's just something I don't want you to do. And the Lord wants us to honor him in those ways. You know, it's not just all the black and white stuff. 
It's not just the Ten Commandments, and it's not just the things that we read about in Scripture. Don't do this, or make sure you do this. There are also those personal convictions that the Lord says, No, no, I'm not telling that person not to do this. I'm telling you. Or I'm not telling that person to do this. I'm telling you. And that's where we really begin to have our personal walk. Where it goes beyond right and wrong. It goes into conviction and that personal relationship. Here's my special calling for you. Anyways, we could spend a whole lot of time on just that. Let's go a little further now. In verse 13, we could sum it up with Habakkuk saying, How could you do this to us? Aren't you paying attention? Lord, aren't you paying attention? Your eyes, they're so holy, they're so pure. You can't just look on sin and give it your approval. You can't stand the sight of sin. Are you not paying attention to what you're doing? You're bringing a sinful people in to judge your people. And I know we're, you know, not perfect. I know we might have some idolatry problems going on here. But certainly we're more righteous than the Babylonians. Or aren't you paying attention? And so often we can say that. You know, we can so often be like Elijah. Lord, what are you doing to me? I'm serving you. I'm doing miracles on your behalf. I'm preaching your word to people. I'm even speaking to the king boldly and telling him where he's wrong. And Lord, now you, you are allowing me to be persecuted. You're allowing this, this wicked woman Jezebel to come after my head. And Lord, don't you know I'm all you've got? Aren't you paying attention? I'm the only one. <laughs> and he wasn't. You know, so often we can be exaggerative in our, our complaints in our lamentations with the Lord. We can exaggerate. No one's ever suffered the way I am. No one has to go through what I have to go through. Lord, I'm the only one. And the Lord speaks to us in that still small voice. Okay, let, let me bring you back to earth here. You're not the only one. So often he points us to the Christ. He says, do you remember what Jesus went through in similar circumstances? You do remember that he lived a life of, of poverty, had no place to lay his head. You know, he, he lived a life that was full of difficulty. People called him a, a, the, the bastard child of his mother Mary. Pe people mocked him when he said, you know, I'm the son of God. Pe people called him, his own brothers and sisters, called him crazy. Don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He, he's a little wacko. Just let us get our brother out of here. Can you imagine what that was like? You know, so often we just pass it off because, oh, he was Jesus. He's God. He, he's fine. But it hurt. It grieved him. You read about him after his dear cousin was, was beheaded, after John lost his life. And Jesus goes away by himself to cry, to, to think about it, to, 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 to grieve over it. He understood what pain was. He, he went through difficult things. And so when we go through problems, whether like Elijah or even like Jesus, the Lord is working in our lives. And He wants us not to call out a complaint to Him, but He wants us to call out, to cry to Him, Lord, I need Your help. Because with Your help and by Your power, I can get through this. You can help me to do all things through the power of Christ. Even the disciples, remember them? They were there in the boat. Jesus was down below sleeping. And then that storm arose on the Sea of Galilee. Lord, aren't you paying attention? Don't you care? We're about to die. Did they really think that Jesus didn't care? That he didn't love them? That he wasn't concerned for them? That he didn't see their fear and care about it? And yet, that's how we can be sometimes. We can be so callous with the one who gave his life for us. Oh, Lord, don't you care for me? Really? You're going to say that in light of the cross? You're going to complain to me in that way? Because I believe the Lord invites us to bring our cares to Him, and to even complain to Him. But I think He also, I think through Habakkuk we understand, He wants us to complain with wisdom, not to complain with exaggeration. Lord, don't you know? Don't you care? Of course I care. I gave my life for you. What you're going through is temporary. I'm going to get you through it. You're going to be up in, in heaven here with me one day. It's going to be okay. But so often, we're not mature in our faith. We're like the little baby who screams and cries because the bottle was taken away. Because the toy was removed. Because the parents did something that he didn't like. So, wah, 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 don't you love me? Don't you care for me? Oh, you don't love me. You hate me. <laughs> I think I told my mom that a time or two. You hate me, don't you? <laughs> you won't give me what I want. Wah, wah, wah. And that's how we are with the Lord. 
And I think he'd rather us come with our complaints with reference of the cross. Because I think our complaints do balance out, and I think we might see them in its proper, proper light if we see it in the light of the cross. So, in verse 14 and through the end of the chapter, he basically complains to the Lord, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Aren't you up there? Remember, he talks about, you're making us out like we're fish of the sea. You don't have anybody to take care of them. Is there anybody up there? And I think all of us maybe have, have cried out that a time or two. Lord, are you up there? Is there a God of he in heaven? Okay, I, I believe that Jesus is my Savior. I believe in God. I believe in the Word. But sometimes, Lord, are you really up there? Do you really exist? Is all of this just a fairy tale like the atheist would tell me? Or are you really up there? Lord, aren't you up there? Lord, aren't you there? And it's a heartfelt cry. And yet we want to be balanced with the Scripture. We want to be balanced with that Scripture that tells us that we must come into His presence, yes, with boldness of faith. With boldness of faith, not unbelief. With boldness of faith. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. And I think we need to be careful. I think Habakkuk is really showing us in, in his own lesson here, because he's going to learn the lesson from the Lord, that, yes, the Lord wants us to cast our care upon him, but there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. When we start accusing the Lord, we know that we're doing it the wrong way. When we start accusing him, we know that our prayers are not proper prayers, that they are not Holy Spirit-inspired. Yes, we can cry out to Him. We can even, the psalmist does it so often. The Lord seems to allow His people to question Him. Lord, how long? Lord, deliver. And how long will it be before you do? The Lord delights to see His people come before Him genuinely with their heartfelt cries. Yet when it begins to cross the line to accusation, we need to remember who we're talking to. Yes, come boldly, but come boldly in faith, realizing that He really is there. And that he really has paid the price for our sins and he didn't have to. Remember who you're talking to. How often did my mother or father tell me that? <laughs> you remember who you're talking to. You're talking to your mother. I'm your mother. <laughs> Don't dispute my word. <laughs> and the Lord so often, I think that's what he'll say. Hey, wait, I'm your father. See, I call the shots. I, I've told my son time and again. He likes to argue his case before me and I invite that. And I tell him it's on a certain condition. You may argue your case as long as you submit to this condition that my decision is final. You can bring your case because perhaps I've told you something and, and you want to bring to my attention, well, Father, didn't you realize when you gave me such a command that this, that, and the other thing? And, and so you're allowed to bring your case, but understand I have the final say. And that's what the Lord says to us. Bring your complaints. Question me. See, yes, I am the God of this world. Uh, that didn't sound right because that's what Satan is called. I'm the creator of the world. I am truly the God of all nations. But with you, I'm your father. You can come to me as a father. Like in the scripture, we can call him Abba. And so we can come to him and very tenderly speak with him and plead our case. Lord, I think you really should understand this before you do that. Lord, I think you need to really take this into consideration. As long as we understand his ways are perfect. His, his thoughts, his ways are so far above ours that we cannot even comprehend it. And it, we have to say in our hearts, yes, Lord, your will be done. Lord, here's my cry, here's my petition, but your will be done. Isn't that what Jesus taught us? See, he knew the Father. He wants us to know the Father like that. So we sing, we'll understand it better by and by. Farther along, you know, that the chorus. But we must believe it too. We must believe it. We'll understand it later. Maybe not here. One day. And if we could just hold that in our hearts when nothing seems to make sense and just trust, okay, Lord, you know what's going on. You know the end, how it's going to turn out, and, and you know the end from the beginning. And, Lord, you're doing all things according to your will and your plan. And so I'll just take it for granted that one day it'll make sense when I stand in your presence. And I'll believe that in faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And the Lord, we thank you for your passionate prophet, Habakkuk, who just opened up his heart, his complaints, everything to you. And he allows you to correct him, as we will see. Father, would you help us to be like that? 
as we open up our hearts to you. Help us to be reverent and help us to be open to your correction. Father, bless these people as they go their way and bring us back together again. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Lord bless you. Actually, I borrowed these from my granddaughter.